How many are thankful to be here this morning? I asked this question last week. I said, how many of you guys would like to talk about the end times? And hands went up all over the place. So that's what we're going to begin a study on the end times. I believe that we are living in the last days. Uh, Jesus spoke about it. The disciples spoke about it. And uh, I believe that we're seeing previews of coming attractions <laughs> as we look at our world today. So uh, if you're not able to see, all you got to do is scoot over a little bit <laughs> that way. <laughs> so I know we got speakers and music stands and all that stuff. I had a little guy go, can you guys move some of the stuff? And uh, it is what it is, right? <laughs> we got what we got. We're outside. But uh, all I know is it's probably a lot nicer out here than it is in a lot of places. Amen. We got to be thankful. And we, we live in a country that we can worship the Lord freely. And uh, not in our building yet, but we're here and we're worshiping the Lord freely. Amen? Yeah. It's a beautiful thing. So let's pray. Let's ask the Lord to bless our time together in his word. Father, thank you for just all the, all the things that you're doing in our lives, God, as we prepare for your second coming and uh, we trust in you that you're going to do a work of your grace both in us and through us, that you're going to prepare us for the things that we have to experience on this earth. And we just, we give you thanks that you are a gracious God, that you love us, that you care for us. And we just pray that you would be glorified, that you would be lifted up. We want to give you the honor and the praise and the glory for all things. And God, I pray that you'd hide me behind a cross that Jesus would be exalted and lifted up as we take a look at your word this morning. We thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So, end times part one. Where do we start? I'm glad I asked. <laughs> the signs of the times are basically screaming at us through a glo global pandemic, COVID-19, with constant contradictory misinformation about said pandemic, a national and global economy that is holding on by a supernatural thread, Mideast turmoil with Israel at the center. Add to that Marxist cancel culture groups that are destroying our cities, major civil unrest in multiple countries, the worst humanitarian crisis, in Yemen that the world has seen in decades, the U.S. and China budding diplomatic and potential military heads in the South China, Chi, uh, South China Sea, and locust plagues of biblical proportions, and then murder hornets. How many saw the murder hornets, right? It's like, what else could possibly go wrong? Now we have murder hornets. I'm not sure what they are. I think you need a 12 gauge to take those out. But there are also murder rates exploding as various cities defund the police, prisoners being let out of prison en masse, yet churches are told that they can't gather in their buildings or sing, freedoms eroding before our very eyes. And worst of all, most of the church is floating downstream like dead fish instead of going against the flow and being the salt and the light that the church is called to be. And you know, as we look at our world, we could see many radical things happening upon the earth, the increasing, increasing prices of food, fuel, housing, and other things that we need to sustain our lives. We also see an increase in earthquakes, famines in third world countries, hunger and homelessness in the U.S., everywhere, including our own backyards. And again, strange diseases or biological weapons like COVID-19, AIDS, other disasters. Then we see advanced technology, the rise of credit cards and electronic fund transfer machines that are taking the place of money. And we are quickly becoming a cashless society. 
The sad part is that young people are losing respect for authority and their parents. There's a definite rise of violence, street gangs, the occult, Satanism, and New Age religion. What does this all mean? Does the Bible talk about these things? Is there really an answer in the Word of God to the things that are taking place? Yes, there is. As we look at the events that are taking place, we see that the stage is almost set for the return of Christ. The play is coming up to the last act. The curtain is about ready to drop. And you know, the bottom line is that Jesus Christ established himself as the most important person that ever lived. No other man in history has influenced mankind as much as this one man. He's gone to heaven, but he's not through with this planet or the people on it. Before he left, he gave his followers an unconditional promise that he would come again. Like the Terminator, he said, I'll be back. <laughs> said by Jesus first, before Arnold came along. In fact, the promise of his return is a focal point that unlocks all the other prophecies. Within the 216 chapters in the New Testament, there are actually 318 references to the second coming of Christ. You would think that it was that it was important to the Lord to let us know about it. Amen. So today we will beginning be beginning to study what is known as eschatology, which is the edib, the study of edible French snails. I'm kidding. <laughs> eschatology means the study of last things. And so this morning, we're going to begin to look at the prophecies concerning the return of Christ, the signs of the times, the coming Middle East war, the seven-year Great Tribulation, the reign of the Antichrist, 666, the last world war, the battle of Armageddon, and many other things that relate to the study. So if you would turn with me to Matthew chapter 24 Matthew chapter 24 and we're going to begin in verse 1 Matthew chapter 24 beginning in verse 1 it says then Jesus went out and departed from the temple and his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple they were impressed. Lord, isn't this great? These are beautiful buildings. That's what I could picture them saying. Because the temple was pretty magnificent. Okay? A pretty incredible structure. In verse 2, it says, And Jesus said to them, Do you not see all these things? Assuredly I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. That's pretty intense. And I'm sure that this got the disciples' attention because they were looking at the glory of the temple and Jesus said, it's all coming down. Do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone will be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. And this was basically talking about what was going to take place in 70 AD when uh, Titus, the Roman emperor, emperor, came into Jerusalem and basically leveled the city of Jerusalem. Okay, the temple came down, all of the above, exactly as Jesus said that it would take place. In verse 3 it says, Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be? 
And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Okay, so like I said, it really got their attention because they asked him, when shall these things happen? What will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age, which basically means the end of the world? When is all of this going to happen? When will be the time of your permanent residence and presence on earth as the Messiah? Because they knew the Old Testament. They knew the Jewish scriptures. And before we get there, this is actually called the Olivet Discourse. And it was questions. And it was accompanied by three specific questions that the disciples asked Jesus. Number one, when will these things be? That is the destruction of the temple that he was just discussing. Question number two, what will be the sign of your coming? Question number three, what will be the sign of the end of the age? And you know, the disciples didn't understand that these questions referred to different times in history. But Jesus' answer addressed both the time of the destruction of the temple in AD 70 and the future events of his return to earth. It is sometimes difficult to follow, but we need to keep these questions in mind. So picking it up in verse 4. It says, And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. You know, there have been many false Christ, false prophets just in the last 40 years. Okay? We think of people like Jim Jones. Reverend Moon, Bhagwan Rajneesh, up in Oregon with his 36 Rolls Royces. Other weird gurus like David Koresh, type prophets. Uh, there's even a guy in Florida that says that he is Jesus in the flesh, but he's telling everybody to get the 666 tattoo. There's a problem with that type of theology. Just thought I'd let you know. And there are so-called Christian prophets today who speak great things that don't literally come to pass. And you know there is one truth that will never change, the only one true God, and you're not him. God's word is going to last forever. Amen? The word of God. Heaven and earth will pass away, but his word will never pass away. Picking it up in verse 6 that it says, And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Interesting verse, verse 6. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars. The first time I heard that, I was like, Don't tell anybody, but well, we're having a war over here. This is a rumor of war, right? Now I'm going to tell you what a rumor of war is when nations say we have our finger and we have a button. We can press it and obliterate you. That is a rumor of war. And that's been going on quite a while, hasn't it? Been going on quite a while. And here it says, see that you are not troubled for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet it's kind of things like the cold war some of us grew up during that time people were living in fear that at any day the russians or the chinese or some nuclear midgets like iran or korea could press a button and blow us off the map and actually bring the beginning of the end you know, the word war in the Greek is polemos, and it means many wars, hostilities, 
And that is exactly what we've been seeing in our world. We saw World Wars One and Two, Korea, different conflicts, Vietnam, Panama, Kuwait, Haiti, Bosnia, Serbia, Afghanistan, Iraq, and the list goes on. And the scripture has totally been fulfilled with even more to come. And yet they will increase with frequency. There's another war. We'll be talking about this later on in our, probably in part two, part three. But it's the War of Ezekiel 38 and 39, the coming war of Magog, which is basically Russia, the Scythians, Persia, which is Iran, and many other nations that will attack Israel. But we're also told that God will protect Israel. Israel. And again, we'll talk about that war more in future studies. Picking it up in verse 7, this is where the rubber kind of meets the road. Because it talks about, it says, For a nation will rise against nation. This word nation in the Greek is ethnos. Basically, one ethnic group rising against another ethnic group. Do we see that going on today? Hello, I don't know about you guys, but I've been paying attention. We've got Black Lives Matter, and guess what? White, brown, yellow, red lives also matter. All lives matter. That's what God's Word says. What about the unborn that we abort? Okay? All lives matter in the Word of God, and that's what we need to remember. And, uh, you know, I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but Black Lives Matter was started by a couple of gals that considered themselves to be Marxists. That's communists, okay? That's pretty hardcore. And yet, they are leading this parade and just getting people all worked up over racial matters instead of realizing that all lives matter. And I, I saw a commercial, they said, you can't say that all lives matter until you say black lives matter. Okay, black lives matter, there I said it. <laughs> so guess what? All lives matter. The Bible also talks about other things that will be taking place. And again, it says, for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginnings of sorrows. You know, nations rising against nation, we see it. Famines, earthquakes, we see it. And then it talks about the beginning of birth pains, literally in the Greek, as a woman goes into labor. The closer that it gets, it increases in frequency and intensity until it finally all comes down. And it is interesting to note that if you study the earthquake activity of the last 30 years and look at the seismic, seismic graphic charts of them, you will see that it looks much like the charts of a woman going into labor. Mark chapter 13 in the Amplified Bible says, For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. These things are the beginning of the birth pangs. And any of the ladies here that have had children know <clears throat> that birth pangs can be intolerable anguish and suffering, right? Pretty intense, pretty intense. And while many people can say these things have always been going on, yes, that's true, but now they happen constantly, increasing in frequency and intensity. And even the fact that the people say that it's been happening all along is a fulfillment of another prophecy found in the book of Second Peter. So if you would turn over to 2 Peter, 
We're going to look at verses 3 through 10. 2 Peter chapter 3, beginning in verse 3. It says, Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willingly forget, that by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of water and in the water, by which the world that then, that then existed perished, being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. Here's the kicker, folks. Verse 9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness. But he's long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's why it hasn't taken place yet. Amen? Because God is waiting for people to come to repentance. Then in verse 10 it says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise. And the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. And then if you take a look at verse 11 and 12, it says, Therefore, since all these things be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be dissolved being on fire and the elements will melt with fervent heat but verse 13 has a promise nevertheless we according to his promise look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells so one day this earth is going to pass away. But guess what? We are going to trade up. Amen? Because there's going to be a new earth, a new heaven. Such a beautiful promise from the Word of God. Now let's go back to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. We're going to pick it up in verse 9. It says, Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And you know, this text talks about Christian persecution. And not only times past, also the present persecution and the persecution to come. And it says, we'll be hated for his name's sake. The name Christian. Many will hate one another. And I don't know about you, but as we look at the things that are going on on the earth, this is coming more and more clear every week, every month, every year. Because when I was growing up, being a Christian was thought of in a good way. Now, not so much, right? Now it's all about hate, and it's all about people are all upset with one another, and... It's just, it's a terrible thing. It says, you'll be hated by all nations for my name's sake. The name Christian. Then it picks up in verse 10. And it says, then many will be offended. We'll betray one another and we'll hate one another. You know what? <laughs> if you don't see that going on on Facebook, you have to be blind. <laughs> The haters, everybody's hating on each other. You know what? 
can't we all just get along? <laughs> the bottom line is we're all here on planet Earth, right? We're all Americans. Last time I checked. <laughs> just get over it. Get over the hatred. Get over the despair and just all the craziness. Verse 11 speaks about the false prophets again. And it says that many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. Look at some of the talking heads. You want to talk about false prophets, right? You're telling us that we're supposed to hate one another because of the color of our skin. That's ridiculous. Totally ridiculous. Because guess what? We all bleed red. And there's a beautiful little song, Jesus Loves the Little Children, right? Black and yellow, red and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. We need to get back to that. Quit hating one another because of skin color. Ridiculous. In verse 12 it says, And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. This is the Greek word anomia, which means having no regard for law or anarchy. Kind of a mob rules mentality. You look at some of the cities that are going crazy right now with the lack of law, the lack of control, the lack of people behaving like human beings. It's just, it's out of control. People are actually moving away from some of the cities that those things are happening in. It's, it's so sad, so tragic, beautiful cities. And again, it says, because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. I don't know about you, but most of us have to lock our doors at night now. Have to lock our windows at night now. Some of us have uh, security systems. Have gates around our house to keep our kids in and keep the bad people out. Lawlessness will abound. And so the love of many will grow cold. So sad. I remember when you could let your kids play in the front yard and not have to worry about it. Little kids could actually walk to the grocery store. Remember those days? Some of us grew up during those days. We could walk to the grocery store without getting kidnapped or messed with or whatever. And as we see the clock ticking, okay, we see lawlessness abounding, the love of many growing cold. Here's a promise. It says, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. So we need to be those that endure. Amen? We need to be those that endure. Don't give up. Don't throw in the towel. Don't go, the whole world's going crazy. I might as well join it. Don't do it. Endure till the end. Verse 14, it says, in this gospel of the kingdom, will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. And then the end will come. I believe that the gospel is going out more and more now than it's ever gone out before. Being printed in thousands of different languages. It's such an amazing thing. And... <clears throat> We see planet Earth basically going kind of nuts. But if you think it's bad now, you ain't seen nothing yet. I don't know about y'all, but I don't want to be here during the Great Tribulation. And the time of God's wrath on a Christ-rejecting world. And again, look at all the current problems. The Antifa. The racial riots happening in so many metropolitan areas. And people getting sucked into the racial wars created by Marxists and socialists who want to take our country down. The media and most of the things that influence our lives will be totally given over to extreme violence, sex sexual abuses, hedonism, a party spirit, get all the gusto that you can, homosexuality, lesbianism, transgenders, 
hey, wait a minute, it already is doing all that. That's already going on. It sounds just like TV today. Many will turn away from Christ as the love of many grows cold. And we just read in verse 14 that this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. And then the end will come. Then we're going to move into a, another phase of everything that's going on. But I want you to take a look at a couple of interesting verses in Daniel chapter 1. Uh, I'm sorry, Daniel chapter 12. Daniel chapter 12 is a very powerful prophetic word. And it talks about that knowledge will be increased. Very intense. Daniel chapter 12, beginning in verse 1, it says, At that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. How many of you guys and gals want your name written in the book? <laughs> Amen? Let's talk about that for a minute. It is impressed numerous times in scriptures <clears throat> that the names of those who put their faith in the Lord will have their names written in a book. And if your name is written in the book of life, you will be delivered from the coming time of judgment on the earth. I personally believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. That's my deal. You don't have to believe that. You can believe pre, mid, post, or pan because however God desires it to pan out, that's the way it's going to pan out, right? Amen. But I tell people that you need to pray for pre and prepare for post Amen. just in case, right? What if we're still here? What if we got it wrong? What if somebody misinterpreted something? But again, I personally believe that God will rapture his church before the great tribulation begins and before the wrath of God hits planet Earth. He will seal and protect also the Jews who accept Jesus as their Messiah. During the Great Tribulation, the bottom line is make sure that your name is in the book. So important. Then look at verse 2. It says, And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever but you Daniel shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall increase Okay, so the book of Daniel is a sealed book. Daniel's prophecy was to be sealed and shut up, but not forever. It was only to be sealed until the time of the end. In these last days, the, the seal is removed. The prophecies wouldn't have made any sense back then, but now they are becoming perfectly clear in these last days. And it is so exciting and fascinating to live in these days where the prophecies of Daniel make sense. Most of them have already been fulfilled and the picture is developing and the puzzle is being completed. <clears throat> so we can make sense of the prophecies that are yet to be completed. One of the amazing ones is many shall run to and fro, travel. Has that expanded and increased just a little bit? Over the last hundred years, 
many shall run to and fro. Then it says, and knowledge shall increase. I don't know about you, but most of us have telephones now that are computers. Okay, so knowledge has been increased, sometimes to a fault, right? How many of you guys have your electronic leash? <laughs> right? Can't leave home without it. <laughs> I've actually driven away from my house, <clears throat> gotten a couple of miles away, and went back to get my phone because I have to stay in touch. All right, let's go back to Matthew chapter 24. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 24. We're going to pick it up in verse 15. And uh, before we go there, in verse 6, Jesus' disciples would see wars and rumors of wars as the Roman troops came and besieged and destroyed Jerusalem and the temple. But Jesus was letting them know the end is not yet. From the disciples' perspective, they associated all the events as one. When you are in the middle of a great time of trouble, you can't imagine that it could ever get any worse, but it will get a lot worse in the future. Jesus was tipping them off to the fact that the end would come much later. And in verse 7 and 8, Jesus also gave some of the signs that the end is approaching. There would be major world wars, famine, pestilence, and earthquakes, all in places that we've never heard of. These are the beginning of sorrows, the birth pains. We are certainly living in a time of great wars, but there also has been horrible famine in many parts of the world, and AIDS and other diseases like COVID are spreading at unprecedented rates. We're also having more earthquakes and other natural disasters than ever before. We are truly at the beginning of the end. But there's good news at the end. So I'm going to finish it with good news, I promise. Some of you guys are going, thanks for all the bad news, Pastor. <laughs> Appreciate your support. <laughs> In verse 15, this is when it's going to really get gnarly. This is the great tribulation. It says, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand, then let those who who were in Judea, flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. Let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing, babies in those days, and pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ or there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. Therefore, if they say to you, look, he is in the desert, do not go out. Or look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered together. You know what's interesting is that there are actually two different places in the Word of God that talk about the return of Christ. One says that he's going to come like a thief in the night. And that he's going to take those who love him away. And that's where we get the the word harpazo, which is in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, which means a violent taking up. 
Okay, that's where the word rapture comes from. Rapturus is in the Latin. Okay, so inquiring minds want to know. I've never seen the word rapture in the Bible. Well, we've seen harpazo, and in Latin it's rapturus. So that's when it talks about Jesus coming as a thief in the night and taking those who love him away. Then it also talks about that in verse 27, for as a lightning comes from the west, from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered together. That's talking about at the Battle of Armageddon. Okay, so Jesus is going to come invisibly as a thief in the night. He is also going to come very visibly. The Bible says that every eye will see him. Everybody's going to know. It's not going to be anything that you have to second guess. Okay, when the Battle of Armageddon takes place. This abomination of desolation refers to the beast, the Antichrist, the son of perdition, the incarnate son of Satan, the man of sin. He is mentioned many times in the Bible. And God will destroy him and his kingdom at the appointed time. There are a couple of scriptures that I'd like to point out to you that are very intense to talk about the Antichrist. The first one is Daniel chapter 11. Daniel chapter 11. We're going to look at verses 36 through 38. Daniel chapter 11, beginning in verse 36 through 38. It says, Then the king shall do according to his own will. He shall exalt and magnify himself above every god, shall speak great blasphemies against the god of gods, and shall prosper till the wrath has been accomplished. For what he is determined shall be done. He shall regard neither the god of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any god, he shall exalt himself above them all. But in their place, he shall honor a God of fortresses and a God which his fathers did not know. He shall honor with gold and silver, with precious stones and pleasant things. Then as you pick it up in verse chapter 12 of Daniel, Daniel chapter 12, beginning in verse 1 again, it says, at that time, Michael will stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time, and at that time your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. Now let's turn over to 1 Thessalonians Chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. This talks about the day of the Lord. It says, but concerning the times, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 beginning in verse 1, but concerning the times, in the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them. As labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you brethren are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. 
Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. Those who get drunk are drunk at night. What's really sad is those that get drunk in the morning. <laughs> Just thought I'd throw that in. <laughs> Verse 8. But let's who, let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. Look at verse 9. It says, For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you also are doing. You know, one of the things that's going to take place in the Jewish temple after the Antichrist allows the Jews to rebuild their temple, the first three and a half years, is going to be peace. The second three and a half years is going to be destruction, war. When he steps into the temple, the abomination that causes desolation, and he says, I'm God, worship me. Very intense. And you know, many of our presidents have tried to make peace between the Jews and the Arabs who have literally been at war with each other for about 4,000 years, ever since Ishmael, who became the father of the Arabs or the Muslim nations, and Isaac, the promised son of Israel, in Genesis chapter 17, most recently, Jimmy Carter, Clinton, Bush, Obama, and now Trump gets them to make an agreement. It is not a covenant. I heard people a couple of days ago, the Trump's the Antichrist. He made an agreement with the Jews and the Arabs. That's an agreement. That's not a covenant. Okay, so again, when someone succeeds, it will be peace for a while. Three and a half years to be exact. 1,290 days, 42 months. It all breaks down to the exact same thing. Three and a half years. The Antichrist will come pretending to be a friend of the Jews as the ruler of the last empire, basically a revived Roman Empire. He will allow the Jews to begin their sacrificial rituals. In the temple, again, Peter will not be happy, I'm sure. Okay? You think they're wigged out about animals getting killed now? Wait till this takes place, right? Anyway, there's a couple of scriptures that I'd like you to turn to. The first one's in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We're going to begin in verse 1 and read through verse 12. This is the great apostasy. It says, Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter as it is from as if from us as though the day of Christ had come let no one deceive you by any means for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and in some versions it talks about the snatching away some of the commentaries talks about that's exactly what it's talking about it says, unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, 
so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining, that he may reveal may be revealed in his own time. Look at verse 6, it says, And now you know what is restraining. Many people believe that the power of the Holy Spirit in the believers is what is keeping the Antichrist from being able to be revealed. Okay? So if the rapture takes place, and if we are taken off, taken up, the gloves are off. Okay? And again, it says, and now you know what is restraining, that he may re be revealed in his own time, for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so. Notice that there's a capital H on he. That designates deity. That's talking about the Holy Spirit. I'm going to read it again. It says, for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And again, that is a scripture that points to the rapture of the church, whether you believe it or not. It's, it's something is restraining the Antichrist from coming, and it's called a he. And that he is a capital H, and that denotes deity. So, my guess, many educated guesses are that that is speaking of the Holy Spirit. He who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Verse 8, and then the lawless one will be revealed. Whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned, who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. You know, sooner or later, God is going to just turn people over to their delusions, to believe the lie. Fall away from Christ. Do not have a part in the salvation that we all pray for. Amen? And we all trust God for. And again, the Great Tribulation is a seven-year period. We're going to take a look at that in Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13, we can actually start off in verse 1. It says, Then I stood on the sand of the sea. The sea there means, means the multitudes. I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the mouth his feet were like the feet of a bear and his mouth like the mouth of a lion the dragon gave him his power his throne and great authority and I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded and his deadly wound was healed and all the world marveled and followed the beast so we see a false trinity coming soon to a theater near us. The first part of that false trinity is the dragon, Satan, the father of lies. We know that there's a real trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, right? There's a real trinity. 
Mark my words, there is a false trinity as well. The dragon is the father figure, the father of lies. The beast, the antichrist, is the son figure. The one who comes instead of or in the place of Christ. And then we'll see the third one as we read on. In verse 4 it says, so they worship the dragon, worshiping Satan, who gave authority to the beast, the Antichrist, and they worship the beast, saying, who is like the beast who is able to make war with him? And he was given a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority to continue for 42 months. So that is three and a half years, 1,290 days, 42 months, it all means the same thing. You know the word all means all, that's all all means. <laughs> Just thought I'd let you know. But three and a half years is 42 months, is 1,290 days. That's how long he is given authority. Then in verse 6, this is the abomination that causes desolation. It says that he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God <coughs> to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, <coughs> whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. Then in verse 11, we see the third person of the unholy false trinity. It says, then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. He exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed he performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men and he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who is wounded by the sword and lived. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. So we see the false prophet in verses 13 and 14, the third person of the false trinity in support of the beast or antichrist he has the power to do great miracles jesus said that false christ and false prophets would rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive even if possible even the elect that is why it is so dangerous to follow signs and wonders follow the word of god satan is able to perform supernatural signs and wonders in order to deceive people and that is what will happen when the beast 
and the false prophet are on the earth during the tribulation. Don't assume that all signs and wonders must come from God. They do not. The mark, the Antichrist will institute an economic system that is cashless. In the name of efficiency and security, he will place a mark on the right hand or forehead of all who participate, and it will be impossible to, sell, to buy or to sell without it. It will, haps, it will perhaps be a computer identification microchip that will link your personal information with a central computer system. Just a few years ago, people scoffed at this notion. Today, however, with all the problems that we are having with identif identity theft, this will be an idea that is easy to push off on people. And this will give the Antichrist complete economic control of the world. Let's go to Revelation chapter 14. Verses 9 through 12, this tells you, do not take the mark. Say it with me. Do not take the mark. One more time. Do not take the mark. Is it going to be a vaccine? Maybe not the COVID one. Could be a little bit more complex than that. We don't know for sure, but all I know is Revelation chapter 14, verse 9 through 12 tells us what takes place of those who receive the mark. Revelation chapter 14, beginning in verse 9, it says that a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation, he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. That's a long time. Forever and ever. That means eternity. It says, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast in his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Very intense. There's another scripture that I'd like to read. This one's in Revelation chapter 16. This is the first bowl of judgment that's poured out. Revelation chapter 16, beginning in verse 1. It says, Then I heard, then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go and pour out the bowls of the wrath of God on the earth. So the first went and poured out his bowl upon the earth. And a foul and loathsome sore came upon the men who had the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. So something is going to go wrong with the microchip <laughs> if that's the case and again when 666 which again could be the trinity the false trinity satan the antichrist and the false prophet instead of 777 the father the son and the holy spirit seven is the number of perfection or completion the number three is the number for the Trinity. So 777 is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
Inquiring minds want to know. 666 is the number of a man. Okay? And his false trinity is Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. So that's 666. That's who you are worshiping if you take the mark. Pretty sad. So don't take the mark under any circumstances. You would be better off to flee or to even die. So aren't you glad that you came to this nice, pleasant Bible study with this crazy pastor this morning? The Bible, here's the good news, folks. The Bible tells us to trust in the Lord, to draw close to him, and to be an overcomer. That's what it's all about. Amen? We need to trust in the Lord, not in man, not in governments. Trust in the Lord. Draw close to him and be an overcomer. No matter what takes place on this earth. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for each person that's here. I pray that you would touch their hearts, that you would minister to them. Let them know that you have the gift of salvation that is theirs for the asking and that you give it to whosoever would believe in you, whosoever would come to you in faith and whosoever would trust in you and be an overcomer. Jesus, we thank you that your Holy Spirit is touching people's hearts right now. If you've never accepted Jesus, you want to do that this morning, just lift up your hand, say, yeah, Pastor, I want to give my heart to Christ. And you will be transformed from darkness into light. That's what the Word of God says. If you've been away from the Lord for a while and you want to rededicate your life to the Lord, then you can do that as well, just by praying that same prayer. If you want to do that this morning, just lift up your hand and say, yeah, Pastor, I want to rededicate my life to Christ. I want Jesus to live in me and through me. God, I thank you for sending your son to die for my sins. I ask Jesus to come into my heart, come into my life, and give me a new life in Christ. Preserve me and protect me from the things that are coming. And help me to stand and to be an overcomer. In Christ, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
Hey, God bless you guys and gals. Thanks so much for coming today. Uh, if you don't know some of the folks that you're worshiping with today, shake a hand, say hi to somebody, get a hug. And uh, we'll socially distance at a point, right? <laughs> anyway, God bless you. Have a great week in Jesus. And uh, we love you guys and gals. You're in our prayers and you're in our thoughts. Bye-bye.